Peace and blessings, beloved. Come here to be educated, empowered, enlightened, inspired, motivated, and challenged to be critical and independent thinkers. Let's get to it. Peace and blessings, beloved. I pray all is well with you and yours. And welcome to the Godly Living video series, Truth About Christmas Edition. Today we're going to focus on the ever so popular yet controversial topic of Christmas, or as we'll come to find it, known as Christ Mass. Now, obviously, in our modern history, we've been taught certain things about Christmas, all of which I believe have been meant to suppress the truth and program us to indulge in consumerism. Even in the midst of certain truths being revealed, such as Jesus not really being born on December 25th, as Christians in particular, we've been deceived into believing that we can hijack the date and use it for our own holy purpose. And what we're gonna do in this coverage is provide context on just what the Bible has to say about Christmas, the various pagan worship traditions chronicled in the Bible, and how they intersect with the birth of Jesus and consequently became the holiday that we now know as Christmas. As always, my prayer is that you receive this with the love intended and that you not take my word for anything, but rather use this as insight and a springboard for your own research. The truth will always be the truth and it will come to light. It's up to us to recognize and acknowledge when it does. David, who says, we have friends who do not celebrate Christmas because they say December 25th is really a pagan holiday. While I agree that Jesus may not have been born on December 25th, he certainly was born as described in the Bible. How do I respond to them? Well, in a sense, tell them they're right. Uh, you see, the, the, the winter solstice a couple of days later was the shortest day of the year. And the pagans had something called Saturnalia. And it was a time of lawlessness because all the laws were suspended. And people, the, a bunch of singers were actually wandered the streets naked singing. And, and then they had orgies, sexual orgies. It was a mass thing. Well, when the Catholic Church came along in Italy, the, the Romans and others didn't want to give up their holidays. So they said, okay, we'll Christianize it. And uh, so they said, okay, we'll say the birth of Jesus was the 25th of December. They, and then there was a, a monk who began to add it up, you see, uh, if you read in Luke, it, it says there's a census taken when Quirinius was governor and so forth and so on. And uh, they, they could take those leaders and figure the exact time dating from the foundation of Rome. And that's when the dates were established. And so they get pretty close to the date. But uh, to say it's the 25th shepherds were out abiding in the field, it gets a little cold at night. I mean, were they out there in the middle of winter? Uh, you know, I don't know. I've been out there on the shepherd's field and on Christmas Eve. It's very nice. But it's cold. And nevertheless, I mean, what was going on? So all this business about mistletoe, pagan. Christmas trees, pagan. Giving out gifts, pagan. Every bit of it is pagan. Every single bit of it is pagan. We've Christianized it all. And uh, so that's good. And so we have time. We celebrate for Jesus. And everybody gets all misty-eyed. But the truth is, we, they're all pagan. <laughs> but the so birth the of Jesus. But the intent of the heart is what it's about. Exactly. So we have Christianized all these things. We give gifts in the name of Jesus. We celebrate his birthday. And uh, it's a nice thing. And so I'm, I'm very delighted. And I like Christmas. All right. So what we have here is Pat Robinson offering up his response and his perspective on the origins of Christmas. And what I'll do with this clip is extract some of the things that he points out as I believe they'll perfectly dovetail us right into the discussion on the origin and the historical impact of Christmas and how we as believers should treat it. 
And so firstly, he mentions the Roman Catholic Church. And what we'll find out is that the Roman Catholic Church conspired with the Roman Empire to merge the pagan celebrations of that season with the Christian celebration of the birth of Jesus. Then next we have Pat referencing the many Christmas traditions and their pagan roots. And we're getting a little more alarming as we go down the list. <laughs> uh, next we have him asserting that Christians Christianized the holiday of Christmas and that being a good thing. And prayerfully by the end of this discussion, you'll feel differently. And next we have him saying that we celebrate Christmas for Jesus once again by videos and it is my prayer that we see this in a totally different light and then last but certainly not least and quite possibly the most dangerous of all are the comments from the moderator towards the end of the video but the intent of the heart is what it's all about and of course she's referencing the celebration of Christmas with the understanding that it has pagan roots and so oftentimes we allow our hearts to lead us and what that really means is our emotions to lead us and that's a big no-no particularly for us as believers we should already know better And that means that we are to be in total submission to God, his plan, his will, and his ways. Then again, that's going to take us perfectly into this discussion because what we'll find out is that God has very explicit instructions for us regarding taking pagan traditions and trying to hijack them for ourselves. And so as with all things... It's my prayer that you receive this message with the love intended. Now, having said that, let's get into it. All right, so what we're going to do is use the book of Deuteronomy as it will provide context and perspective on how we should view proper, a.k.a. righteous worship of God. Now, our focus is going to be on chapter 12, but first we'll go over the entire book so we have the proper starting point. Now, Deuteronomy was written around 1406 BC at the end of the 40 years of wandering endured by the nation of Israel. And the word Deuteronomy means second law. But it should be noted that Deuteronomy means much more than a simple copy of the law. It offers a restatement of the law for a new generation. Now Moses addressed his words to all of Israel at least 12 times. And this phrase emphasized the nation's unity initiated by their covenant with God at Mount Sinai, which was forged in the wilderness. So again, what we're talking about symbolically is every believer. Now in the midst of of the widespread polytheism of the time Israel was distinctive in that they worshipped one God the God that we know Yahweh our creator and that God was totally unique that God is totally unique that God will continue to be totally unique there were no other gods like him there will never be any other gods like him and unlike this covenant that God made with Abraham, the covenant between Yahweh and Israel was bilateral, meaning what? It was a two-way street. God would keep his promise to bless Israel if Israel remained faithful. And now the adult Israelites weren't there for the initial covenant ceremony at Mount Sinai and re-covenant with Yahweh. He entreated the people to recommit themselves and this is Deuteronomy 30 19 and 20 I have set before you life and death the blessing and the curse 
So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by holding fast to him. For this is your life and the length of your days. And what's important to note here is that this, in verse 20, refers to loving the Lord your God, obeying and holding fast. And that's basically what our lives as believers should be. Our relationship with God is to be marked by faithfulness, loyalty, love, and devotion. Again, we use the concept of marriage, and we know that the concept of marriage is likened to Christ and the church. And we know that God sacrificed for us, and we ought to do the same for him. And our sacrifice is again in faithfulness, loyalty, love, and devotion. Dying to self that he may live in us. And so again, I just wanted to provide an overview of Deuteronomy. So that we know that everything contained in this book is meant to be the reissuing of the law. So that Israel, aka all believers, would commit themselves to God. In all their ways Willing to sacrifice all To please him And so that brings us to chapter 12 Where Moses comes to the statutes He had to give in charge to Israel And of course we begin with the worship of God The Israelites A.K.A. all believers Are charged not to bring the rights and usages of idolaters into the worship of God not under the guise of making it better guise meaning the false intent we cannot serve God and mammon nor worship the true God and idols nor depend upon Christ Jesus and upon superstitious or self-righteous confidences they must not even inquire into the modes and forms of idolatrous worship. Think about this. What good is it to take something that's pagan and flip it to worship God? Who does that really please? God or the adversary? Who we know as Satan. All right, what I think will be helpful is if we briefly go over the actual chapter of Deuteronomy 12. Namely, the portions where God speaks against idolatry and he provides the proper way to worship him. And with this video that I'm about to play, I inadvertently clipped the last verse. And it reads as such. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take from it. And what's important here is that as we take a step back and honestly view the way that the modern day believer has taken Christmas and tried to take the power out of the pagan roots and flip it to quote unquote Christianize it. One could ask himself, is this adding to or taking from God's very clear admonitions to us? And so having said that, let's get into the chapter. These are the statutes and rules that you shall be careful to do in the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. You shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods, on the high mountains, and on the hills, and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars, and dash in pieces their pillars, and burn their asherim with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. But you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go, and there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes, and the contribution that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. 
and there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your households, in all that you undertake, in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You shall not do according to all that we are doing here today, everyone doing whatever is right in his own eyes. For you have not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance that the Lord your God is giving you. When the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations whom you go in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care that you be not ensnared to follow them, after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods, that I also may do the same? You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abominable thing that the Lord hates they have done for their gods. For they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. All right, and so to wrap up this section, I want to give a brief summary of Deuteronomy 12. And we'll just take verses 29 to 32. And so basically what Moses was saying here to Israel is that once God blesses you with the land of the heathen, you must be careful to not inquire about the way the heathen serve their gods because we are not to worship God in that way. He even goes so far as to say that the Lord hates the way that the heathen serves his gods because of the abominable things that they do, such as sacrificing their children in fire. And remember that last verse, Everything I command you, you must be careful to do. You cannot add or take away from it. And so it's really clear cut. It's no way that we can get around not applying this to our lives. Especially if we understand that when God makes mention and reference to Israel, he's referring to all believers all who he calls his children his chosen people his elect and that's who we are as believers and so once again this will allow us to have a more enlightened perspective on how we should view any and all pagan worship because Christmas isn't the only tradition you also have Easter and then if you really want to get down into the pagan aspect not necessarily how we try to Christianize it, but just speaking about pagan traditions, Valentine's Day has a very sinister origin. We'll get into that. Of course, Halloween. Um, and, and just about any other holiday that you could think of and those that you aren't even aware of that we'll address in other videos. But again, getting back here, I wanted to provide this overview so that we know exactly what God says. As we conclude this, I do want to go in depth into the God and goddess worship that existed during the time of Israel's captivity and freedom so that we have the full scope of why God had to provide this law and why he focused on idol worship and giving it to Moses. And so we know that God early on and very clearly commanded the descendants of Abraham not to have any other gods besides him. And we can go to Exodus 20 and 3 as proof of this. And that loyalty was to be the basis of the covenant relationship that God had between himself and Israel. Now, of course, looking back, we know that biblical history is punctuated by the plethora of times, the myriad times that Israel turned its back on God and engaged in pagan worship. In order to have the full breadth of perspective and context, we need to go back to Babylon and namely the construction of the Tower of Babel. And so at the time of the construction of the Tower of Babel, referenced in Genesis 11, 1 through 4, mankind had indeed multiplied, but spoke one language. And so we have Cush, who was the son of Ham and grandson of Noah with his son Nimrod blueprint this tower which was to be mankind's version of a religion 
And so it's with that perspective that we understand that Nimrod was the originator of sun worship and founder of Babylon. And I want you to note that term sun worship. And we're talking about S-U-N, not S-O-N. Because as you'll note, not only in this coverage, but additional coverage on the topic of the occult. They worship the sun. They worship seasons. They worship plant life. They worship animals. And so I don't want you to think that anything's too far fetched that you hear because these things have been going on since antiquity. But getting back here, we have Nimrodic once again as the originator of sun worship and Babylon. And so we know that Babylon was to have a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Referenced in Genesis 10, 8 through 10, and Genesis 11, once again, verse 4. Now they called the Tower Babel, a.k.a. the gate to heaven, but God referenced it as confusion. And there he confused the language of the people and forced them to scatter. And so as a result, mankind discontinued the building of this tower and were scattered to different parts of the world. This is referenced in Genesis 11, 8 and 9. And so this left Nimrod with plan B, which included incest, and that he was to marry his own mother, whose name was Semiramis, and together they would go on to forge this new false religion. And the goal was to take away the worship and the ordinance that God had already established. Because what you'll note is that in honor of Semiramis and Nimrod, they designated a holy day as Sunday, S-U-N day, as to be the holy day, the holy Sabbath day of that time to that people. And Nimrod and Semiramis's brand of sacrifice in which they tried to contort and twist God's requirement of sacrifice, theirs included human sacrifice. Most often, the children, the babies of their followers. And so it's with this backdrop that we have one of Noah's three sons, Shem, who is also Nimrod's great uncle, in wrath, kill Nimrod and cut him up into small pieces as an example to others to not commit such abominable sins. And so right here we'll stop and note that Shem was a godly man and it was actually through Shem that Christ would come. And so understandably, post Nimrod's death, his followers were a bit apprehensive to continue in their worship of him against God. And so this drove them underground. And of note here is the idea of esotericism or the hidden or the occult, which manifests itself in the various secret societies that we've heard about. Because what they do, what their purpose is, includes a deception of people into thinking that they're serving God when they're actually serving Satan. That's why we must be sober minded and vigilant and on guard because Satan is always on the move, he's always on the attack. He's a very offensive adversary. And for a short period of time after these practices moved underground Semiramis had an idea of how she could successfully revive Nimrod and give him new form and so not long after his death Semiramis became pregnant now her story was that Nimrod died and went to the sun S-U-N and the sun thus became a symbol of Nimrod 
She told the people that a ray of the sun had come to her and impregnated her with a child. And that it was actually Nimrod coming back in a reincarnation of the sun god. Now this child, his name was Tammuz. And together these three were worshipped as the personification of the sun god. And this is where we find the unholy three-in-one trinity. And so now at this point we have Semiramis proclaiming that Nimrod, her husband, was a god. And that she, as his wife, was a goddess. She announced herself to be the queen of heaven and that she should be worshipped as such. She claimed that her spirit was the moon and when she died she would dwell in the moon even as her husband Nimrod was already in the sun. And so here we have clearly the twisting and contorting of God's word into a lie. And as stated in Romans 1.25, people who worshipped and served the creature as opposed to the creator. And so because this sun slash moon worship was becoming more popular had to be pushed further underground as Christianity was the prevailing religion of that time and once underground confessionals and a priesthood were set up and Semiramis used both of these things to her advantage to exercise and maintain control over her followers and of course we know if we have any basis of understanding of the Roman Catholic Church that there is a relationship between the parishioner and the priest whereas the parishioner confesses to the priest as an intermediary between the parishioner and God now Semiramis used this dynamic in order to manipulate misuse and abuse her followers by understanding what their weaknesses and their vices were And so once again, moving forward, we have idol worship in full swing. And in particular, this worship was considered Baal worship. Baal worship, however you want to pronounce it. B-A-A-L. And this means of worship, this type of worship, caught on fast. And it spread to many parts of the world. In Egypt, Semiramis was known as Isis still the queen of heaven and Nimrod became known as Osiris also frequently called Horus aka the sun god in Phoenicia Semiramis and Nimrod were worshipped as Ashtoreth and Tammuz in Greece they were known as Aphrodite and Eros in Rome Venus and Cupid and in China, Mother Sheng Mu and her child. Now moving back to the topic at hand, referencing Christmas. When the cold season began every year, they believed that their sun god was leaving them. And it was on December 25th that they noticed the gradual return of this sun god. Of course we know as Nimrod. And so they called this day the birth of the sun, S-U-N. Now Tammuz was hailed as the son of the sun, the S-O-N of the S-U-N. And he was idolized and even worshipped. And the first letter of his name became the symbol of sun worship. Human sacrifices to the sun god, S-U-N, were offered on this letter made of wood known as the cross and this cross this T for Tammuz is also the true origin of Catholics crossing themselves and I'm sure you've seen the gesture that Catholics make when they touch their head region and then they go across their chest I think they go uh, to the middle lower middle and then they go from left to right if I'm not mistaken but this is purported where 
that originated. Now the true date of the birth of Christ is most likely between July and September. And from what I understand, closer to September. But since the exact date of Christ's birth is unknown, it was suggested back then that the same date as was celebrated for Tammuz's birth be celebrated for Christ's birth, which was December 25th. As this was the time when the sun had reached its lowest point on the horizon and began to start back up into the heavens. And so as such, the sun god had come to life, so to speak. And so gradually, December 25th came to be known as the birth of Christ. And the papal church, papal referencing the Pope, Roman Catholic Church, finally instituted a special mass on that day called Christ's Mass. And so eventually we know December 25th became Christmas. And so once again, beloved, what I wanted to do here was not force feed anything upon you, not pressure you into changing what you believe, but rather just providing information from the word where we should derive all wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And I wanted to just show what God had to say on the subject. And what you'll find is that he's very serious about idol worship and how we should reject it and steer clear of it. Because in doing so, we can begin to live the life that he has called us to live, one that he can be pleased with. And if we don't do it, and if we choose to live as the pagans live, then we might as well reject Christ because he will reject us. All right, beloved, so I think I'll stop here. As this was meant to be a concise examination of Christmas, to spark in us enough curiosity to seriously question our belief about its validity and place in our faith. Now listen, I know it's difficult to let go of long-held traditions, I get it, particularly ones that have been marketed so well by the enemy. You know, they pull at our emotions, they use concepts of love and family, and of course we know the most egregious of all, the birth of our Messiah. Jesus Christ all in efforts to deceive us and while I don't find any value in assigning blame at this point I do assign accountability to each of us to pray for knowledge wisdom understanding and discernment so that we can remove anything from our lives that is separating us from God and endeavoring to pursue holiness at the expense of self now for those of you who are reading this who aren't followers of Christ I would sincerely ask you to take some time to be alone and think seriously about what I've shared I want you to consider your life and the following questions and then ask God to reveal himself to you in such a way that you have absolutely no doubt that it's him who's communicating with you because the truth of the matter is God has a very specific answer to all of these questions and he shares them with us freely in his word and so I implore you beloved don't gamble with your life because once you leave this earth that's it your spirit will pay for the decisions your flesh made Question number one, how did the universe come into being? Question number two, why am I here? Question number three, what is my relationship to my fellow man? Question four, what happens to me once I die? And once again, God has a very specific 
detailed answer to each of these questions. And it's incumbent upon us to do our due diligence to seek the truth. Because we know the truth will set us free. All right, beloved, that's a wrap. Now, do note that I will create a postscript in which I'll cover every pagan god and goddess listed in the Bible, as well as go over the origin of sun worship and how it relates to the modern day so-called Christian traditions that many blindly engage in. As always, thank you for the support. And I pray very sincerely that you receive this message with the love intended and that you apply it to wisdom. I very much look forward to sharing and growing with you. Until next time, be blessed and be a blessing.